Hello, and welcome to Sustainable Outlook, a podcast from global law firm k and Gates, where we discuss the transactions, technologies, and trends in the sustainable economy. We hope you enjoy this discussion. Please reach out with suggested topics or guests or questions about how we can work together to create a sustainable economy. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Sustainable Outlook. I'm Elizabeth Krauss, the partner in K&L Gates' Global Power Group. I'm joined today by Amanda Shane, who is the U.S. Public Affairs Specialist at the Global Public Affairs Marketing and Communications, Sustainability and Public Affairs Division of Global Wind Powerhouse Vestas. Prior to joining Vestas, she held roles in communications in various political organizations, including the Office of U.S. Representatives, Mike Thompson and John B. Larson. Amanda, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Amanda, you know, Vestas is a huge company. They do development all over the place, as well as, of course, a lot of manufacturing. What does it take from a public policy angle to convince a manufacturer like Vestas to build turbines in the United States? I mean, Vestas already has an onshore manufacturing presence with our facilities in Colorado. So we have been convinced to build turbines here in the U.S. But when it comes to the offshore side of things, you know, it's definitely a challenge because we as a country are competing with an established marketplace in Europe. You know, offshore wind has been going for decades in in large parts of the EU. And the U.S. is trying to accomplish in like the next few years what Europe has built out over the past 20 years. And so that requires um, both investment and also a lot of infrastructure upgrades. And we're seeing that play out already in states like New York and New Jersey and Massachusetts and Virginia, you know, all of these first moving states. You know, there's been large investments in ports and also in laying the groundwork for manufacturing, but it definitely requires some investment in order to, you know, build from the ground up facilities that already exist in Europe. The offshore turbines, right, they're huge. They're um, massive. You know, it's been well established that we're, we're definitely going for size here, <laughs> at least in some respects. Investus certainly is. I can't help but wonder, does it make sense to manufacture this stuff in Iowa or do we need to look at New Jersey? <laughs> I mean, the, the challenge with these offshore machines, like you said, they're, they're absolutely huge. You're talking about blades that are longer than the length of a football field. So transportation becomes a, a real issue. And that's one of the you know, kind of key factors that drives where you place a manufacturing facility. Mm-hmm. You know, unfortunately, you can't really put them in, in a state like Iowa because moving them on rail and certainly by trucks just isn't feasible. So they have to be kind of close to the quayside so you can move them on barges or other vessels. So that really does mean that you're looking at states that are either coastal or have like a national blue highway like New York, which is coastal in certain parts, but also the Hudson River, you know, provides some opportunities as as well. And you can see that in some states, but you know, water is definitely key to building any of these larger components. You know, and the other aspect of it is is acreage. Again, because of the size of some of these these components, the need for both storage space as well as an eye of the future, they're not getting smaller. (laughs) Uh, They seem to just be getting larger, means that you do need considerable land. And that's been a challenge to find in the U.S. You know, I think coastal properties are are very valuable for a number of different uses besides just manufacturing. And so, you know, finding something that's got the right acreage and the right access to water, free of bridge height restrictions, because again, these things are so big, you you know, that's definitely been an ongoing challenge for the industry. So does that mean that states like Iowa and other Midwestern states that don't have proximity to the water, are they out of the picture here? Not at all. And I think, you know, you can already see investments being made in some of these more inland states for smaller subcomponents, right? Just because uh, you have to build some of the really large things close to the water doesn't mean that the whole supply chain needs to be coastal. Um, And so, for instance, I look at New Jersey, you know, which is doing foundation manufacturing at the Port of Paulsboro. And, you know, they're sourcing some of their components from states like West Virginia and Kentucky. Um, I think you mentioned Indiana as well. Um, so there's there's certainly a lot of opportunity for these smaller subcomponents, um, whether it's pieces for nacelles or whether it's composites for blades, um, some of the raw materials, they can come from all over the place. And that's, I think, really necessary for the health of the industry in order to source things from diverse locations across the country. You know, I always point to the aerospace industry as an example of where offshore needs to go. And when you think about the aerospace industry, not every single state and not every congressional district 
produces jet engines. Um, but certainly just about every state and nearly every congressional district have some small subcomponent that feeds into the industry. Um, and that means that it's a very resilient industry when it comes time to, you know, talking about incentives or talking about necessary tax credits or R&D opportunities. You know, it's a model that the offshore wind industry uh, needs to follow. And why is that important? Is it important politically? Is it important just from a technical resiliency perspective? Yeah, I think it's both, right? You know, political parties come and go in terms of who has power. And so industries that have resilience are those that benefit both blue and red states. You know, and so what we see in the offshore wind industry is that these first moving states, for the most part, are these blue northeastern coastal states. And if you want the industry to survive as a whole, I mean, like, that's fine when Democrats have control of those states and have control in Congress or the White House. You know, I think there's a lot of momentum towards keeping those projects moving forward. You know, but if there's no benefit to the nation as a whole, um, then it can become a target, right? So if you can start looking, and we're already seeing this, right? We're seeing vessels mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. built in the Gulf Coast that will support the offshore wind industry. Again, we're seeing these smaller subcomponents starting to be sourced from other states. Um, and so it does help show that this is an industry that that really can bring jobs, not just to these blue northeastern states, but to the country as a whole. Well, I mean, I think that's a really important question right now, particularly because of the offshore wind build out is it's moving very quickly. And even yes. though there have been efforts over the last, you know, 10 years or so, a lot of the most noticeable events have occurred very recently since Biden became president. So if we can obviously establish resilient supply chain and things like that in the near term, that's fabulous. But if we can't, then what happens if there's a change in administration? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the fear, right? You know, I take a look at the previous administration and there was a lot of rhetoric against wind as a whole, not just offshore wind, but onshore wind as well. However, it was the offshore wind projects that really stalled out. You know, the permitting process just didn't move forward under the, under the Trump administration. But the onshore industry was largely insulated. And I think that's in large part because of the sheer number of blue collar jobs that are attached to the onshore industry. And so I think that's why you're seeing such a uh, rapid build out. You know, there's already been groundbreakings at like the New Jersey wind port and in Massachusetts at the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal in New York. So there are very real construction jobs that are now tied to these projects. Um, and there's a concerted effort, I would say, by state lawmakers and also by the industry as a whole uh, to get projects in the water pretty rapidly so that we can start building out the workforce. And I think that will really help insulate the industry from a change in administration. Because at mm -hmm. the end of the day, I don't think any politician wants to be the one that sends blue collar workers to the bread line. Hardly, hardly. Well, and so what do we need then to, to move faster? I mean, let's say worst case scenario, there is a change in administration. There's a massive title, title change in Congress, whatever. What do we need now to move this train faster? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we have been tracking quite closely was the Build Back Better Act. Um, and obviously that's been stalled out for, for quite some time now, but there were some really important climate provisions. And every once in a while, you still hear some murmurings that perhaps Congress will do something on the climate side. And part of that package included manufacturing tax credits that were specifically geared towards offshore wind. And those tax credits, like I said, would, would help level the playing field and make the U.S. competitive with Europe. And they're really pretty much necessary in order to build something from the ground up when you're competing with such an established marketplace. And those tax credits wouldn't just allow us to build parts here in the U.S. for the U.S. I mean, they could potentially allow us to export components uh, to Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, globally, that would be a really big move um, because Europe has already announced larger targets for their offshore wind build out. So there's a huge market globally growing for this. And for the U.S. to not only succeed in its own build out, but potentially supply, you know, the build out of Europe. I mean, that's sort of unprecedented in this modern age. And that would be an absolute huge game changer for the industry. And, you know, I think there's been some more talk as of late about, you know, energy packages, whether it's something that resembles the climate provisions and build back better, whether it's some type of all of the above menu of options to help the U.S. sort of establish its own energy independence and energy security. 
I really do hope that Congress can get behind, you know, some form of those those tax credits. Again, not just to you know, help build the offshore wind industry, but also, you know, to help our own energy supply and, and make the U.S. Uh, competitive on a global marketplace. But you can also take a look at like what's happening at the, the various state levels. So you have states like New York, which is part of its latest um, offshore wind procurement is, is going hard in trying to uh, attract investment in either, you know, blade manufacturing or nacelle manufacturing. And, you know, the government there has authorized about $500 million towards the supply chain build out. And that's a huge investment. And, you know, that certainly I think goes a long way to, to bringing these components shoreside and helping make them cost competitive with European components. And so definitely those types of state investments really do, you know, help establish manufacturing. But at the end of the day, we're going to need a, a little bit more of a regional approach. And that's always mm -hmm. been a bit of a dirty word when it comes to, to states. You know, <laughs> Again, you're talking about half a billion dollars that New York is investing. And you know, they definitely want to make sure that the jobs and economic benefits and the return on that investment comes to their state. And that's very understandable. You know, but when we talk about the health of the industry as a whole, you know, like we said earlier, it's, it's very much dependent on making sure the supply chain can also pull from you know, areas that aren't just those coastal blue states. States, you know, mm -hmm. that we can source components and build workforces, you know, that are more inland um, or that come from areas that are a little bit redder. So what I'm hearing is that you think that there are enough factors to impact the need for federal intervention. It's not enough just to have some states invested in the offshore wind industry. Really, there's there's a there's a reason for Congress to, to be involved, for Congress to fund this. Yeah, absolutely. Because otherwise, you you know, you get these winners and losers. You get states that are very, very wealthy um, being able to sort of buy their own manufacturing facilities, whereas states that perhaps are struggling and need the jobs and have good infrastructure or good access to the water, you know, if they can't compete with like the New York prices, then that's not helpful <laughs> for the industry. <laughs> and when you're looking at, you know, a lease schedule that includes, you know, both mid-Atlantic states um, and Gulf Coast states, you know, there is going to be a need for a geographically diverse supply chain. Um, and so the federal government does have the opportunity to help level the playing field, you know, so that you can go to, you know, whichever market is best set up to build your component. Now, I think just to change direction slightly, I think we're at an interesting point in the offshore wind industry. In that, you know, we've got these political factors, we've got these questions about federal spending, we've got these factors about supplying power to the grid in a novel way that can solve a lot of problems. But we also have a lot of technical things going on. You know, we've got a lot of talk about making floating wind, for example, commercial. Do any of these technical advances matter for the data points that are most important for the political sector? You know, we've, met, we've talked about jobs, we've talked about infrastructure spending, tax base. Yeah, Does absolutely. Anything matter? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially on the floating uh, side of things, you know, we've pretty much with the conclusion of the Carolina Long Bay auctions, you know, earlier this year, we've probably seen the last of the purely fixed bottom lease auctions. And so from here on out, you know, the future of offshore wind in the U.S. is, is going to be floating. And this is an area where the U.S. could really lead because floating is still rather nascent, I would say, globally. You know, we're participating in several build outs. We've done multiple pilot projects. Um, we're starting to to do some utility scale work and floating, but you know the world is not as ahead of us um, in this sector as they are perhaps in the fixed bottom side of things. So you know the U.S. I think has the potential to really invest in this technology and, and find some novel solutions because floating, you know, while it is the future, has some real unique challenges. You know, these foundations for the floating platforms can be the size of a football stadium. You know, they're absolutely mm. massive. And you have to assemble the turbines key side when you're doing floating, at least right now. You know, there's there, you know, there's companies that are looking into how can you do lifts um, at sea on these unstable platforms. And, you know, that's an area where the U.S. could certainly invest some research because if you solve that yeah. problem, you definitely free up a lot of space um, yeah. at the ports. 
because that is that's a huge challenge. I mean, just the cranes needed to kind of lift these turbines into place and mount them on the the floating foundations, and then you know the boats that need to then tow them out to the lease site. They take up a lot of space. <laughs> mm-hmm. like, again, I mean, like that's that's just the the end of the day. And so when you have that much space taken up by pre-assembly activities, um, then where do you manufacture them? Again, if you also need to be located by the quayside for these mm-hmm. larger components. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I look at the West Coast, for instance, and there's a lot of constraints on their ports. You know, mm-hmm. you have just um, you know ports that are that are largely dedicated now for shipping containers and based on supply chain needs, I don't see that going away. Um, or you have ports that are um, occupied by the Navy or the, the DOD. And again, like that's not, you're not going to be able to interfere with that. Or you have ports that have aerospace restrictions or bridge height restrictions, and that presents a challenge. And there are definitely some sites out there that you know, are going to be used for the build out of the offshore wind industry. And we're seeing that already with like the, the ports at Humboldt. Um, and there's mm-hmm. been some, some talk with the Coos Bay area in Oregon as well. But there are significant challenges there. There's also, you know, safe harbor requirements when you're towing these, these big turbines out to the lease site. If you don't get there within a certain amount of time, you have to go and find safe harbor somewhere. So that means, you know, your port needs to be relatively close to your lease site. And the Morro Bay and Humboldt lease areas are in totally different parts of, of the ocean around California. So uh, there's real logistical challenges there. And the U.S., I think one of its strengths is R&D um, mm-hmm. and is in technological breakthroughs. And so I think, you know, investment in, you know, some of these these new dynamic lifts um, at sea or, or anything else, um, you know, new ways to, to make some of these materials. You know, we're seeing investments in you know, additive manufacturing and such. Are there, you know, ways that we can change how we make some key components? They don't have to be key side. Um, so you can free up space. You know, there's a lot of value to that. And again, that would serve not just the U.S. market, but those technological breakthroughs could potentially be brought to the global market. Yeah, I think that's a really good opportunity there too, to, you know, deploy American innovation, right? Yeah. We kind of missed the boat on solar, got to admit it. But we could embrace OSW. You know, we touched on this a little bit, some of the political headwinds that there could be for offshore wind and have been historically. But, um, you know, I I just want to observe here that we're recording this episode just after the White House essentially intervened in a very large anti-circumvention investigation concerning solar modules. And they also announced, I think this has been a little bit downplayed, but they also announced at the same time some very large intended investments into climate tech, especially renewable energy. You know, obviously there's a limit on what the White House can do without Congress, but it seems like they are really interested in pushing that limit to the max. Now, it's pretty obvious that there were multiple reasons for the announcement, but I wanted to ask you, do you think that there are actually some political goals here that conflict with the goal of building out the U.S. offshore wind industry? Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think that they conflict, you know, even when you're talking about broad energy policy, even if you're talking about something that includes like a menu of various options or an all of the above option, like we've been hearing Senator Manchin talk about when when he's considering climate right. provisions or energy provisions. You know, I don't think that's in conflict with offshore wind because the U.S. has massive energy needs um, and offshore wind has the, the potential to serve a significant portion of those. But there's a, a lot of energy that is needed in the, the whole U.S. And so it's very complementary to also have investment in solar, to have investment in onshore. In the short term, you know, there might need to be investment in traditional fossil fuels, again, because of everything that we're seeing happening in the Ukraine and Russia. Um, there's just global constraints on, you know, oil. Absolutely. Market. You know, and and everybody, I think, is feeling the pain of these rising both gas prices and electricity prices. You know, and at the end of the day, like the health of this industry really depends on being able to keep the cost of energy low. Because if you as a ratepayer, you know, suddenly see your bill skyrocket because of investments in uh, or switching to, to renewables, like that's that's not going to be helpful, right? That's not going to be helpful to anybody because costs of everything are going up. Um, and we don't want to send the message that this this technology is is more expensive because globally we can look at Europe and see that it's not. 
Um, so you do need investments, though, across the board. You need investments in transmission as well um, and in hardening our grid. We haven't really mm -hmm. taken care mm -hmm. of our electric grid in, in a number of decades. Uh, <laughs> and so there are some much needed improvements there. You know, and so having these, these across the board investments and these complementary technology, I think, will go a long way towards allowing the U.S. to, to shore up its domestic energy supply. Mm -hmm. Well, can I just push on that a little bit? Because I mean, I think one of the things about the Biden administration and the current Congress is that there's been a lot of emphasis on labor. There's yep. been a lot of emphasis on domestic manufacturing, some some emphasis on equity also and justice. You know, all of those factors have potential to slow things down, at least according to some people. Um, do you think those are going to be major hurdles? I, I don't. I don't think they're going to be hurdles. I mean, I think that the offshore wind industry has the opportunity to to build out its industry the right way. You know, the energy industry traditionally has been has had its challenges when it comes to working with um, environmental justice communities. Heck, the term environmental justice community exists in large part because of the amount of pollutants um, that energy companies in the past have dumped into their neighborhoods. You know, so there's an opportunity here uh, as the offshore wind industry to do things better and to do things the right way. And I think there's a lot of interest in that as well. You know, and again, if we look at Europe, you know, the build out of offshore wind has often taken place in, you know, areas where fossil fuel was dominant, especially coal, if you look at, at certain parts of the EU. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and transitioning those workers from, you know, a fossil fuel driven economy to, um, you know, one that's driven by renewables. It, it can absolutely be done. You know, here in the U.S., there's absolutely challenges in building trust in a number of different communities. You know, I think depending on where you are, you know, there's been plenty of times where people have come in or industries have come in and they've promised a bale of goods and then haven't delivered. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the offshore wind industry then has to take stock of, you know, the political reality of wherever it is that we're building out and make sure that we're working with partners in the community to kind of build trust um, and recruit the workers that we want to train. And, you know, the labor challenges, you know, I don't view them necessarily as challenges. I think that, you know, labor in the Northeast is long established. And, you know, I look at some of the agreements that publicly have been struck, um, like Orsted, for instance, has signed a deal with the building trains um, about the offshore work that's going to be done for their projects. Um, and I think that that can serve as a model for the work that could be done, you know, across the board in the U.S., you know, so that you can have good paying union jobs um, and also at the beginning of this industry, you know, have the opportunity to have those folks trained by experienced um, folks from Europe who have put these projects together, you know, for decades um, because mm -hmm. that's, you know, at the end of the day, this work that's offshore, you know, is dangerous. And so you do want to make sure that, you know, you're training people correctly and that there's an emphasis on safety um, and that you have experienced hands at play. And then as our U.S. workforce gains experience, you can transition some of those European trainers out. Um, so I, I don't, like I said, I don't see it necessarily as a hurdle um, or as a roadblock. I just think it's something that we have to be very conscious about. And, you know, my experience so far has been that the industry is very conscious about it and is trying very hard to engage um, with a number of these these different communities. Excellent. Well, Amanda, thank you so much. This has been a, a wonderful discussion. I really appreciate your perspectives and insights. Any parting shots for the audience? <laughs> <laughs> No, you know, it's it's uh, a really exciting time to be part of the offshore wind industry right now. I think there is a ton of potential um, both for jobs, um, good paying jobs, and also for a supply chain that spans not just these coastal states, you know, but also goes deeper into the U.S. Um, and I'm really excited about the momentum we're seeing. And you know, if anybody knows Senator Manchin, please remind him that the uh, tax credits that were part of the Build Back Better package for climate or real keys for moving the industry forward and creating yeah. these jobs. <laughs> and potentially can impact a lot of states way beyond the coast. So. 100%. <laughs> Thanks very much, Amanda. Um, thank you for joining us and thank you to the audience for joining us for this episode of Sustainable Outlook. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sustainable Outlook. To listen to past episodes and receive notices for new episodes, 
subscribe by searching Hub Talks, that's H-U-B Talks, in your favorite podcast app. We hope you will tune in next time to learn more about the outlook of the burgeoning sustainable economy.